All right, well today on the Genus Brewing channel, we are at the Grain Shed. The Grain Shed uh, works very closely with a company that we've mentioned before on the channel called Link Malts. Uh, uh, and they are a fantastic little nugget here in Spokane, Washington that uh, makes fantastic breads, makes fantastic beer. And it's an all around cool place to hang out. So check out their social medias in the link below. But what are we talking about today, Logan? Uh, apparently a bunch of fermentous yeast. Bunch of fermentous yeast. So what, I, what I'm kind of figuring is a lot of people they know about yeast and they've seen yeast in recipes, but they don't really know uh, everything that you can use a certain yeast for. And I know that we've been more versatile with some of these yeasts than most people have even tried to be. So today we're gonna be going over everything you can do with each type of yeast and fermentus. And we'll start with the ones we're most familiar with and tell you what we've used those for. And then we'll kind of go into ones that we haven't even seen yet, good gosh, that we're excited for and tell you what you might use those for, kind of speculate uh, and then uh, leave the Leave the experimentation open to you, maybe, on that one. All right, so what's the first one you want to go over, Logan? I don't know. We uh, probably should start with the uh, good old workhorse, the <clears throat> way, way over-glorified US-05. The prodigal son, Chico Ale strain, the same as American Ale 1056 uh, uh, flagship in Imperial, and uh, let's see, it's called California Ale in uh, White Labs. Of course, they all work a little bit differently, but uh, US-05 is probably I would say if it's not USO5, it's one of those variations. It's the number one yeast we see in recipes that come through the brewery. Yeah. And before we bash too much on it, let's just talk about why people use it so much. Um, first off, um, it's a strain that will ferment anywhere from about 60 to 75 degrees and still be relatively clean in its fermentation. Um, and that's kind of the, probably the biggest reason why home brewers have really fallen in love with this yeast is because um, that's probably the hardest thing to do when you're home brewing. And when you're using a very neutral yeast base, you, you kind of leave the world as your oyster when it comes to exploring different territories. And so, although it's most commonly used for IPAs and paleos, I would say more than anything, I've seen it used for blondes, cream ales, colches. I've seen it used for a couple of wheat beer styles. I've seen it used for porters, lagers, stouts, anything in yeah anything in the world. You've kind of, we've kind of seen this one used for. Yeah. Um, so what do you, what would you say are its pros and cons? Um, so its pros are that for one, it's really easy to get a hold of. Um, two, it's actually pretty cheap. Um, and then three, it just it goes through a tear and fermentation pretty much every single time. As for my biggest con about it, um, I'm gonna let you cover the flavor, but my biggest con um, is that I have had um, really, really hit and miss experience with whether or not this yeast flocculates, which means that um, clobs together, drops out in the bottom, leaves you with a nice bright beer that you don't have to find. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Kind of a crapshoot. So overall flavor profile on this, it is very neutral, but it is uh, leaning into that kind of minerality feel or sense, uh, which means it lends well into making hoppy beers or beers that you want to perceive a little bit brighter. Uh, on the other side of the flavor, the thing that you get that not a lot of people expect is this yeast actually will produce diacetyl if you don't do a full proper VDK rest or a high temperature fermentation. So if you're fermenting this at 66 degrees, depending on your strain, if you're gonna stress this yeast out at all, you can expect some diacetyl will be uh, a part of it. Uh, and this, for the longest time, wasn't really thought to be a thing until people started doing heavily dry hopped IPAs, which has been a fad in the, uh, in, in the last, I don't know, what, three, four years. So hopcrete is a, a really interesting phenomenon that occurs in really heavily dry hopped beers. Um, part of what's in hops are, are oils, as well as other proteins, other enzymes, um, that actually can cause um, a very, very small secondary type fermentation. Um, but during this process is, as, is where you're actually gonna get kind of more diacetyl. So if you don't do a rest after this, that can end up staying in your beer if you pull it off the yeast too soon. A lot of people, yeah, they end up pulling it off the yeast and trying to crash right after doing a dry hop because they want to preserve that fresh hop flavors, but it's created a little bit of diacetyl and you don't taste it until the final beer when all the yeast is gone and yeah. it's too late to get rid of it, so. Yeah, and this is literally something that will show up um, two, three weeks after you've kegged the beer, but that it wasn't there at the beginning. So, womp, womp, womp. That's pretty much it about USO5. Fantastic all around yeast. So honestly, I end up using it more for porters and stouts than I do IPAs. Um, let's go into some unique uses of our next yeast. We'll go into SO4. So SO4 is probably my second favorite strain from Fermentus. Um, it is a fantastic strain for doing a wide range of beers. I usually do it in anything, um, classic English style IPAs. 
um, all the way into my porters as well. Um, this is your traditional English strain. On the cold side, it will actually be very clean, somewhere at about 60 degrees, 62 degrees Fahrenheit, which is where I prefer to ferment it. But on the high side, you can produce these really nice, well-balanced, um, dark fruit sort of prune and plum characteristics to it. Um, so yeah, SO4 is, is sneakily versatile. There's a lot of things you can use it in and we're planning on experimenting yeah. with even more stuff. Yeah, if you want to kind of compare this to your traditional USO5, um, it's going to actually leave you with a little more round of a mouthfeel if you're using it in your typical IPAs. So yeah, it's great for hazy sounds. Great like. for hazies, exactly. We, I think we've used it in hazies before as a oh, matter yeah. of fact. Uh, so what should we go to next? Uh, let's go to good old K97, the uh, German ale strain. Yeah, K97 is the one that you're going to want to use if you're doing uh, traditional style gozas. Uh, if you're doing kind of like German wheat beers on the more neutral side, so less banana clove than like the fine stuff in our strain. Uh, and uh, also can be used, I've seen that used for hazies as well. What else can you think it, be, it can be used for? Uh, a lot of, I mean, Kolsch, uh, German, well, not German, um, what am I thinking of now? Uh, cream ale? Cream ale, uh, used it for Oktoberfest actually before, even though yeah. It's not really a lager strain. Yeah, 59 to, 68. 59 to 68, but I've actually fermented this down at 56 degrees. It slows down that fermentation quite a bit, but throws this fantastic, um, really rich, creamy profile to the beer. Um, otherwise, if you ferment on the high side, it's gonna go ham on you. <laughs> yep. It is a fantastically uh, versatile use as well. Uh, one of the downsides I would say is this is low flocculating like a lot of German ale yep. strains will be. You definitely so. have to find it. Um, also, you start creeping up towards that 70 degree mark. I notice it'll start getting pretty darn fruity. Um, if you're throwing yeah. a lot of hops at it, it can actually play really well with the hops. Um, so I've, I've actually made a handful of IPAs with this and it works um, just really fine. Good. Um, like Peter said though, the only thing is don't expect to have a, a clear bright beer at the end of it. Yeah, exactly. So bottom line with this one is it, it, it's a German style, uh, definitely slightly malt leaning. Yeah, yeast creates some fruitiness, but without that heavy banana-ness that you get from a Hefeweizen strain. Um, speaking of Hefeweizen strains, we should probably talk about the one that Fermentus makes. Bam! Uh, is that the T58? Nope, it's the nope. WB06. Yeah, WB06, which we don't have right now. <laughs> Sweet. Great. Good job, Pedro. <laughs> so WB06, we're out of it. Uh, Hefeweizen strain, traditional, I believe that is the Weinsteppen. That's the Weinsteppen Hefeweizen, Hefeweizen, yeah. Strain, yes. Yeah. I, don't, I don't even know what to say. It's, it's, yeah. if, you, if you're going for a traditional wheat beer, it's just the strain to go for. It's, it's right? what you, yeah, it creates that phenomenal uh, sweet, uh, round banana character, but still being bright and sort of minerally. And yeah. so it creates clean beers, but with a, the note of that sweetness. So it's not as heavy as like a Belgian Abbey style beer. Or a wet um, beer. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but it creates nice fruitiness that's definitely in that banana realm. And that's, that's pretty much, so Hefeweizens and Dunkelweizens are pretty much all I've personally used it for. Yeah. Um, I don't know too much outside of that range that I would try it out for. Maybe, I mean, cl classic Bavarian style, like wit beer, something like that, um, where, where you want to down that spice. But that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, Hefeweizens yeah. are the another the very house. aggressive fermenter, I would say as well. And Absolutely. I've actually had the strain drop right on me um, from lagering it for a few weeks before too. So yeah. Um, depending on you know what your grain bill looks like, don't be surprised if you end up with a crystal visin after letting it sit for a month. Well, while we're talking about lagering, why, why don't we go from the fine stuff and wheat beer strain to the fine stuff and lager strain? Oh man, you're break, you're pulling my heartstrings. That's going to be the uh, Sap Lager 3470, and as I said before, the SO4 is my second favorite strain. This has definitely got to be my first. Uh, this is honestly my go-to strain for any beer. It's a very traditional, extremely neutral lager strain. Um, ferments at an extremely wide temperature range, which is why I personally love it. I have fermented this strain anywhere from like 49 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 70 degrees. Um, stays perfectly clean for the most part, and uh, yeah just tears through anything you throw it at. Yeah, so we've, we've used it for a lot of light beers and lagers and stuff. I can see it being used for an IPA very successfully. We have used it for one of our IPAs before. Uh, I would even say I'd be happy to use this strain in any porter stouts. Things that you want relatively neutral and clean that you yep. want to just let the malts shine on. 
this is a really great yeah. piece to use. I think the bottom line is that um, the 3470 just does not throw hardly anything for, for esters, which is what you're gonna get from all the other ale strains. Um, so it ends up with just this a stupendously clean beer um, in the end. So any kind of IPL that you're doing really lets those hop profiles come through without the yeast distracting from it. And to hammer this point home just a little bit further, uh, this does have a really, it's a lager yeast that ferments at a really wide temperature range. And so if you're the kind of brewer that's like, I can only brew lagers in the winter, yeah, uh, this is, might be something you try out off season, even if you're fermenting a little bit high because we've had phenomenally clean lager style beers. I think, you know, you're getting into the spring and you want to ferment a Maybach or something like that. Try this out. It can work work wonders and make a nice clean lager uh, yeah. pretty much any temperature range. Yeah. So I think the only downside to this yeast strain um, has actually got to be a, a water chemistry thing that I've noticed with it. Um, and if you are using this for light lagers, um, definitely make sure that your water chemistry fits the profile of the beer because um, any kind of minerality in your water, um, this strain will actually push through very strongly. So I happen to have extremely hard water at my house and uh, I've noticed that I have to actually soften that up quite a bit, just basically adding distilled water in order to make a really, really smooth tasting traditional um, German beers are usually what I'm going for. Otherwise, this will push through that minerality very, very sharply. So if you've got hard water, what I always recommend is try to use some of your tap water, as long as it's good tasting tap water and not super, you know, chlorine-y or yep. you know, it's got some weird pipe issues or something like that. And then just cut it with distilled water or RO water that you can get at the store. Yep, all I do is sparge with distilled water. Works great. All right, so now we're into, by the way, now we're into territories of yeast that we don't use very often. We've used them a handful of times, but uh, definitely not our wheelhouse. So this is kind of getting into speculation territory territory, just a PSA from us, but T58. Um, yeah, no, T58, Saison's, makes fantastic Saison's. Um, super, super peppery, in my experience. Yep. Um, so gonna give you more long lines of a French Saison versus a Belgian Saison. That's gonna give you those like big bubble gummy notes. And um, yeah, that's about all I have to say. Yeah, uh, ferments at a pretty wide temperature range. Uh, I wrote down uh, fennels and esters, so we'll create some of those fennels and esters, so that's yeah. why people use it for saisons. You can use it for a Bavarian wheat, like a Hefeweizen as well, uh, but in its profile screams a little bit more saison. Might be a good starter for like a sour beer if you wanted to start it with kind of that aggressive note and then finish it off with bacteria and Britannomyces. Um, but overall, again, not one we've used too much. Um, Farmhouse beers, that's what I'd recommend it for. Yeah, that's Any kind, kind of, of a farmhouse. That's, that's the wheelhouse. For, for saisons that yeah. I've done, I've mostly used liquid yeah. yeast, and so. Especially on the low alcohol end is what I would highly actually recommend that oh, for. Yeah. Saisons are typically high alcohol, but if you want to do a more session um, saison, um, something- Really bump that. Yeah, something in the four to five percentile mark, uh, yeah. that guy's gonna give you a lot of flavor um, to work with, so. Um, all right, so speaking of, uh, Yeast that we haven't used very much. Uh, S23 is a yeast that I've probably only used four or five times uh, in my in my brewing career. Uh, S23 for me created a really crisp, like classic American style lager. Uh, however, what it said it's used for is giving a lager with a slight S3 profile, which I didn't expect because when I created a lager with it, it was super dry and crisp and minerally. Yep. Um, I've used this a couple times. I personally haven't even noticed much of a difference between this strain and the 3470. Um, I think the two, in my opinion, can be pretty darn interchangeable, other than the fact that the S23 will not have that wide temperature range. Yeah, the biggest thing that I would say uh, between the S23 and the 3470 is that I don't think S23 is as much of a workhorse. That could just be because I haven't used it as much, um, but if you're using the S23, I would say use it like a proper lager strain, which means you need to do a starter and you need to be working on your temperature control when you use the S23. That said, uh, every time I've used it, I've created some phenomenal beers with it. So it can be a very flavorful and tasty yeast, but uh, it, it's not as, uh, as plug and play or as ready to go as something that's like a workhorse like 3470 is. Um, if you've got other experience with, with uh, any of these yeasts that we've used less often, please let us know in the comments below. Like I said, there's only a handful of these that we've used quite a bit, uh, and the rest of them we've kind of used onesies, twosies. Uh, I think in our yeast arsenal at the shop, we probably have, what, 150 to 200 yeasts? Somewhere oh, we range. got a lot of yeast, yeah. We've we used got yeast a, for days. We've used a ridiculous amount of yeast in our brewing <laughs> careers, and so some of them we've used a lot, and some of them we've used only once or twice, and so this is kind of where we're falling into this territory going forward. But um, we're hopefully here to help you navigate and speculate if you guys want to do some experimentation yourself.
Um, next, let's go 30, uh, S33. Uh, S33 I've seen used in a wide range of styles. Uh, so the one that I see S33 used most commonly in is actually if, if you're doing it like a Guinness clone or an Irish ale uh, style beer. Now, they don't say that on the website, but that's, what, that's the, uh, the, the realm that I see that used uh, most often. So yeah, uh, S33, like, we haven't used this very often. Um, on the website, they list Belgian ales, which I don't really get, but I see it used most often in uh, Irish ale recipes. I see that very, very often. Uh, Scottish ale recipes, uh, I've seen it suggested for New England IPAs, um, but basically it's a slightly fruity, low attenuating yeast uh, with a more specific and focused uh, temperature range than something like the uh, 3470, for example. Yeah. I think for Belgian ales, I think really what they're getting at is that if you want to sort of tone down a Belgian ale or do something a little bit more along the lines of like a Belgian blonde ale, um, that you're getting a little character but not punchy in the face, Belgian style stuff that you have to age out for six months, that might be a sort of cheater way to uh, get to where you want to be faster. Uh, let's go into S189. So S189, we personally have not had very good success with. We've used S189, I think, three or four times in the last two years, just trying to brew with it and trying yeah. to figure out what it does. Um, what it's known for on their website, they say floral and hoppy lagers. Um, what we've known, for, what, what we've gotten off of it is it's something you definitely need a VDK res with. Very, very long VDK res for that matter. Yeah. Um, also, this is um, as for just, you know, fermentation beastliness. Uh, this is like a two on a scale of one to 10, in my opinion. Um, yeah. It'll get through a fermentation, but it won't tear through it like some of the other lager strains that we've used. It takes the proper uh, coaxing. Takes the proper coaxing. Um, so really with this strain, it's I think it's a matter of, of sheer pitch rate um, to get good results with it. I think what we've done in the past is we thought that we were pitching a good amount, you know, throwing generally about a couple packs, um, even sometimes with the starter at a five gallon batch of beer. But I think for this strain, you need to up that even more um, just so that beer can clean itself up a little faster. Like Peter said, go through a proper BDK rest, go through a proper lagering um, in order to really get the profile you're looking for. Yeah, I think so for the first, to give you uh, our personal example, the first couple times we used this, uh, we did a lower pitch rate. I think we just did two packs for a five gallon batch. Just wanted to see what it was gonna, what it was gonna do. Um, and uh, uh, we always do some sort of a BDK rest, but uh, this one we definitely didn't uh, really push into that realm. It was one of our homebrew style batches. So we were kind of trying to see what it would work for uh, through you guys' perspective, not brewing as a commercial brewer, but brewing as somebody who might use this at home. Uh, and both of the first two times, we got 1.5 pentane dione. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about VDKs for a second. There's two common VDKs, you know diacetyl. So when you think VDK rest, you probably think but diacetyl rest. Um, but 1.5 pentane dione is the other very common VDK. Yeah, so what Peter's talking about too, for all of you that haven't watched our other video on VDKs, uh, VDK sounds for uh, visceral diketones, right? Visceral. Visceral diketones. You always say visceral. Visceral is the fat around your stomach when you when you grow a beer belly. Uh, well, <laughs> you know what? They can be visceral sometimes, let's be real. Um, anyway, so these diketones um, are precursors to one, um, which is going to be uh, your diacetyl and two, the pentane dione. Diacetyl happens if uh, you happen to be really good about keeping any kind of oxygen out of, out of the beer. Um, but uh, pentane dial happens if there's any kind of oxygen that's still left in the beer, which a lot of times with lagers is going to be the case because of those colder fermentations. Flavors on these, the diacetyl is your classic buttered popcorn flavor that you get in beer. Uh, and the 1.5 pentane dial is going to be kind of a sickly sweet honey-like flavor. If you'd like to hear us talk more about uh, off flavors in beer and where you can get them from, uh, let us know in the comments below. I'm sure we'll get to that eventually. Anyways, so highly endorsed, obviously, by our personal experience. Uh, that is S189 from Fermentus. What do we got next? Uh, next, I think that goes through all the ones that I have brought. Um, let's go through some other ones just real quickly. We're just gonna bang these out really quick. Um, so there is uh, a couple of uh, Belgian style strands that we didn't bring here. There's BE134. I would use that in a Saison. Um, that one has a wide temperature range. Very bright, very peppery, uh, fun one to use. There's BE256, which is their Abbey style strain. Oh, Abbey. we've used that. Uh, have we? I think so. I don't, I don't know if I've used that one yet. I think I've used that one. 
Okay. Yeah. It works well. Yeah. So, uh, what do you say, a sweeter Abbey or like drier Abbey? Uh, on the sweeter side, I think. On the sweeter side. Yeah. So really punching forward probably those prune notes and stuff like that. Um, classic flavors. Uh, there's F-2, which is their bottling and cast conditioning ones. Which I definitely need to use. Yeah, so basically what those ones do, uh, they uh, they're really good at fermenting simple sugars, the common sugars that uh, you're going to be used to bottle or cast condition, but they do not ferment maltotriose, which is a higher starch. They do not, basically they don't ferment starches that give body and thickness to beer at all. And so they will very, very cleanly ferment what you want them to, and they will not ferment what you don't want them to, yeah. which makes them perfect for bottling or cask conditioning. And usually they have a pretty high alcohol tolerance as well. Yeah, exactly. So you can throw them in without uh, a lot of coaxing and they'll, they'll, they'll do their job. Yep. Um, they have ha! HA18, uh, which is their basically, uh, uh, it's their, their barley wine strain. They're uh, finishing a barley wine strain is what I should say, because it's super, super fruity. So with barley wines, I don't recommend using a high alcohol strain like that, because if you use that 100%, you get tons of higher alcohols, you get tons of fruitiness, you get tons of just like bleh flavors. So ferment it with the cleanest, greatest tasting strain that you can, and then finish it with a high alcohol tolerant strain like the HA18. So remember for any kind of beer, a uh, good rule of uh, thumb to follow is actually going to be that the more sugars you give a yeast to chew on, um, the more character you're gonna get from that yeast. So, so yeah. slightly fruity yeast become amplified fruity yeast when you throw them at a 10% beer. Um, let's talk about the LA01. This is one that I think that you'd be super, fami uh, super uh, familiar with. Not, I, not familiar with, <laughs> this, is one, this is one that I think that you would have a lot of fun with. Um, so remember that time that you tried to do the uh, the cold mash for a low alcohol beer? We want to talk about that, Peter. This yeast has an average attenuation of 15%. What? This yeast will not ferment any sort of higher sugars. Why? 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 This is this that? is the low alcohol to no alcohol beer yeast, and I didn't I didn't I did not know this exists until digging through Fermentus's website. But did this you is order a thing. some? Did you order some? Of course. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, somebody actually recently commented that they want us to make a low and no alcohol beer. Uh, and lo and behold, when I'm doing my research on a fermented style yeast, low and no alcohol beer yeast comes up. So we found the uh, perfect beer for the perfect methods that we don't scorch everything on. We'll find out. <laughs> Uh, other than that, you have Saf Sour. Um, Saf Sour is a Lactobacillus plantarum. They're souring yeast if you're making sour beers. In okay. our experience, I wouldn't spend a lot of money on a plantarum sour because Good Billy is super cheap in the store. Yeah, that's all that Good Billy is, yeah. Yeah, so for a better pitch, I'd probably just go with Good Billy. Um, <laughs> uh, that said, I mean, getting it from a yeast tree, you might experience something different. That's true. It could be, yeah, because, I mean, I always notice with Good Billy, it actually tastes like yogurt, so I don't know yeah. if that's the yeast strain the yeast or the order. fact that people are, like, putting three packs of yogurt in their beer. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> um, so if someone else wants to experiment with Saf Sour and let us know how that tastes for them, that's great. Uh, so far, for my sours that I like to do, I like to do a combination of acid malts and uh, lactobacillus buchneri. Is that the one? Buchneri. Buchneri. Yeah, that's the one from Y yeast, yeah. and so that, I found, creates a phenomenally complex flavor of beers. Um, so that's that's us really quickly rattling off any uh, uh, any yeast from Fermentus that we've used or haven't used yet that uh, would like to try. So if you've got any experience with Fermentus yeast that we haven't used, we'd love to hear it. Comment below uh, or shoot us a message on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, all great information. We'd love to, to, to hear your stories. So I think that pretty much sums up our review on uh, all the Fermentus style yeast, everything that we've used and we're thinking of using in the future. And magically we have beer refills. Which is super good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, wait, we got somebody else sitting next to us now. I don't, I don't know what's happening. His name is Tedatha Macbeth the Third, and uh, uh, you know, what'd you bring us? Uh, so, Logan has purple Egyptian, sixty percent purple Egyptian, forty percent Scots, but it's super delicious. You have the dark Munich, which has a bunch of Baroness. All of it is Baroness dark Munich, and a little bit of C twenty, C one twenty in there. Nice. And then I have hundred percent Scots bear. That's awesome. If you want to learn more about these beers, we'll post all the links to uh, the grain sheds. Uh, social media is below and to Link Malts where all these 
beer grain malts came from. Uh, thank you so much for letting us enjoy your space and taste your fantastic beers. Do you have anything uh, fun coming up with uh, some yeasts maybe that uh, aren't fermentous that you've been using? Yeah, actually we have a really, really neat uh, project beer coming up that we brewed about two months ago that we fermented 100% with sourdough starter. So instead of using any <laughs> brewer's yeast, any baker's yeast, it is completely made with sourdough starter that we call Levan. So Levan is the, the pre-fermentation uh, bunch of goo that you add in with other flour and water to make sourdough bread. So we, we used uh, 14 pounds of it and fermented straight on top of it and it's actually super delicious. That sounds awesome. <laughs> so like pseudo kvass style with that? Yep, and we actually included bread in that beer as well. So it is bread all the way around. Nice. Damn. Well, if you guys want to watch us, hopefully, taste the breadiest beer in town in another video in the future, let us know in the comments below. Uh, until then, please follow The Grain Shed on all social media platforms. We'll post those below, as well as Link Malts, where they get all the grains for their beers and breads and all that stuff. So uh, uh, until next time, cheers, guys. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, comment, Beep. ring the bells, follow yeah. us. Viva la beer. Viva la beer. I Viva really beer. just want to like have that shot of the kaplunk going into the beer. All the sourdough just, yeah. <laughs> just dropping oh, down some beer. It, we, we only got like, it was a barrel and a half and we only got a barrel off of it because there was so <laughs> much shit in the bottom of it. It was, and you know, it's like a full link bucket full of <laughs> just, just stuff. <laughs> in the name of science.